Welcome to Fundamentals of Faith from Love Walk Christian Thank Center. You, Thank you, Father. Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord. I'm excited to be here this morning. Amen. Amen. Let's jump into this this morning. Amen. Father, I just thank you for your word and for your presence. I thank you for the for uh, what you have to say to us today. Father, I ask right now in the name of Jesus that you have your way today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's start in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 9. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. It says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We're going we're gonna to tackle that part this week. Amen. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, I don't know if y'all remember because it's been like two weeks, but um, one of the last things I said uh, in the last time I was preaching this was that the kingdom alters and changes the course of the curse. Okay? And so when we are coming to the Lord in prayer, what, there really isn't another reason to pray other than to see his kingdom come and his will be done. And if you recognize what that means, then it's easier to pray. Because if you don't know what it means, you're just coming to God because you need things. Because somebody else needs things. Because you want things. But when you recognize that you're coming to God because you have an expectation in your heart for his kingdom to come in your situation. So therefore, what happens then is instead of praying about the little itty bitty situation because most of the time you know the the things that look really big in our lives are are really insignificant overall right but they they are impacting us in a big way and the thing is that if we can come to the realization that God wants us to pray his kingdom into that situation he wants us to pray his will into that situation so it's going to change the way you think the way you pray you're not begging him to do something you're not oh please god won't you and will you and when will you and and i need and and i want and 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 i don't know if you're going to do it for me you're going to begin to have an expectation that god wants his kingdom to come he wants his kingdom to come. See, what you're doing is you're getting into agreement with what God already wants. You're, you're not praying things that you want. You're getting in agreement with things God already wants. You, you know if you, will, if you will study out and, and spend time with and, and, and get to know God's kingdom, and God's will, then when you pray, there won't be a confusion. There won't be a question of whether God will do this because you're getting into agreement with what God already wants. If God wants something, he has every intention to see it done. And the problem is that man doesn't want to get into agreement with him. We want to whine and complain and say exactly the opposite of what he's saying. I, I mean, that's no different. I, I've talked about this before. Uh, that's no different than as a parent if I'm, if I'm dealing with my children over something, okay? And I say, I say, look, I need you to stop this behavior. And if you will just listen to me, then the outcome is going to be great, you're going to love the outcome. I'm, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to take care of you. Everything's going to be fine. But if you don't want to listen, then there's going to be a negative result. There's going to be a consequence, right? And so because of the humanness of our nature, my children, I'm sure yours do too, or you did when you were a child, they don't hear the blessing side of the conversation. All they hear is there's going to be a consequence. Oh, my goodness. I, what am I going to do? My parents hate me because they're going to take this or they're going to do this. They don't hear, look, I want to bless you. I want to give to you. I want to help you. I want to take care of you. I want to give you better than you already have. They hear you're going to take this away. Well, what you don't understand, even as a child, is 
typically, if we're going to take something away, it's because it's hindering you. It's because it's hindering you. It's getting in your way of, of doing what you're supposed to do, right? What? Today, the biggest, the number one thing that kids, are, that kids deal with is the, the, the phone. And adults, too. Okay? The number one thing is that phone. And, and that phone hinders you from doing all kinds of things you're supposed to do. And it, it, it involves you in all kinds of things you're not supposed to do. And so when there's a consequence of losing the phone... You go into panic mode. Oh, my gosh. Oh, and listen, so, so yes, for, for young people, it's because, oh, mom and dad might take it away or they, I might be grounded from it. But an adult, God forbid you leave your phone at home when you go out somewhere because you're in a panic mode all day long. Oh, my God, my phone, my phone, where's my phone? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? How will anybody get a hold of me? And, and what if I need this. And I, but sometimes the very thing you need is to be separated from that. Because it's hindering you from your relationship with Jesus. It's hindering you from your relationship with your spouse. It's hindering you from relationship with your children or your, with your parents. It's hindering you from doing your work or your schoolwork, right? But we, we don't see it that way because, oh, that's my blessing. Is, is it your blessing? Or is it the curse that's stealing from you? Well, listen, I'm not against phones. I have one, too. And, and in some ways, I have some of the same issues, right? Because we're all, we've all gotten attached to those things, right? And I'm not talking about your phones, okay? What I'm talking about is that when we get into agreement with what God's saying, if, if, if I'm talking to my children about a blessing or a curse, uh, uh, I'm going to give you something or there's going to be a consequence. They can either get into agreement with me for what I want to do good for them, or they can stay in opposition to me and there's a consequence. But when I come to God in prayer, if I know what his will is and I see what's in his kingdom, and I get in agreement with that, then that's what he wants to give me. But if I can't get into his will, and I stay in opposition, even though I desperately want, right? I desperately want the answer to my prayer, but I don't want to walk into agreement with him because I want to whine. I want to complain about it. I want to assume he's never going to give it to me. Like, like when my children assume that I'm going to give them a consequence because what they hear is, I'm going to keep doing what I want to do and you're going to give me the consequence that I don't want to have. Right? Which is sometimes what we do with God. God, I need this, but I refuse to change. I want this from you, but I'm not going to do anything that you require of me. And therefore, I know you're not going to answer me because I'm not going to get into agreement with you. Therefore, I'm expecting the consequence instead of the blessing because I know I'm not going to do what you want from me. I know I'm not going to walk it out. I refuse even. But please give it to me anyways. Right? Everybody's okay, right? All right. All right. Let's, um, the kingdom alters and changes the course of the curse. Amen? We know this. Um, we know this. Galatians chapter 3, this isn't new. I'm just going to go over it. Oh. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm having a little personal summer up here, and I don't know if it's because the air's not on or if it's because I'm having a personal summer. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
we are redeemed from the curse of the law. It, it is a finished work. But more often than not, we get in agreement with the curse instead of with the blessing that God's given us. We, and, and that's, listen, that is the reason why the scripture here says that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. It's not a might like, oh, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to give it to you. It's a might because you might not receive it. It's not a might because he's reserving whether he wants to give it to you. No, it's finished. It's already given to you. You are already redeemed from the curse of the law. It is a finished work. The blood of Jesus made the sacrifice one time forever. There's nothing that can change that. But what happens is in order for us to walk in the blessing that he's given to us, we have to receive it. And so that's where that word might comes in because I have redeemed you from the curse of the law. That the blessing of Abraham might come. It, it, so not might like maybe, but might like you have to receive it. You have to, everything in the kingdom works by faith. You have to believe that you are redeemed from the curse of the law. You have to believe you're redeemed from the curse of the law every time. Every day. Every time an attack comes against you, you have to believe anew. You, you can't just believe one time and then it's good forever. You have to believe new every time. So you know you got healed this situation, but along comes another situation, and all of a sudden you're wondering, how come I'm not healed? Because you have to believe anew. That you might receive the blessing of Abraham because it's a finished work. It's yours. But each time you have to receive it. Each day you have to receive it. Each day you have to decide, I'm going to. That, that, that's why this is about prayer. That's why our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I'm coming into the place of recognition of what my position is, who I am in the Lord, that I'm coming to the Father in the Son. So I'm coming from the position of Jesus and that I know then coming from his position, he's going to give me anything that I ask because I'm asking what he already desires for me. He already desires his kingdom to come. He already desires his will to be done. And all I'm doing is getting into agreement with what he already desires for me. Right? But I don't have to get into agreement. I can choose death and I can choose the curse and I can lay in it and wallow in it and be miserable in it. And each and every one of us has done that from time to time. Way more often than we should. Beca and, and listen, it's not just, a, oh, I got a random miracle and maybe I'll get another one someday. No, you are supposed to get that miracle every single time. But if you don't keep that faith alive, if you, so you, you have to work faith. You, you have to keep faith alive. You, you can't... You can't uh, a lot of times what we do is we get a victory and we get super excited. Have, have you ever gone to a football game and seen the, the team get a, they, they, they get a score and man, it should be the winning score. There's only like 10 seconds left in the game and they just, they, they, they are, they should win. And they start celebrating on the sidelines. Everybody's screaming and yelling. The team has quit because they think they've won the game and they get back out there for the last play of the game because the other team is up and they have one last chance, 10 seconds left in the game and they throw the touchdown. And you lost. What? Because you quit. Because you got a victory and you quit. And Christians do that all the time. They get a victory. Oh, I got this miracle. Wow, it's so amazing. And they stop getting in the word and they stop getting in their faith. They have an amazing, awesome faith conference like what we had last weekend. And oh, wow, I'm so, I'm so jazzed and pumped up. And then, and then we get out of faith. 
we get out of faith. Well, because we had a victory, now I can rest. See, if you're going to rest, it's okay to rest. But if you're going to rest, you got to rest in faith. You can't rest and just quit. You have to rest in faith. The, those football players have to go back out there just as strong in that la last play as they did in the one before. Because if they don't, the other team can take it. And the same thing happens in the spirit. If you let your guard down, Satan will jump right in there and take it. He'll jump right in there and take it. Steal the word and take your faith. So, we are redeemed from the curse of the law. It does belong to us, amen? Let's go, um, let's go to Matthew uh, chapter 5. I want to talk about... I just want to talk about the kingdom of heaven for a little while. There, I love the book of Matthew because Jesus spends a lot of time teaching about the kingdom of heaven. But he does it in a lot of really subtle ways that if he, he uses a lot of parables. Um, so the teaching is in such a way that you have to dig for it. You can't just read it and go, oh, I got it. You, you have to dig for it, which is which is why it says, um, I, I'm going to go ahead and turn there for a second. Keep your place in Matthew 5. It's why it says in Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. He, God desires for you to seek after him, to seek after his word, to seek after his kingdom. And, and seeking requires action. You can't just sit there and go, man, I'm a Christian, everything's wonderful, and not seek. You can't just go out there and bless people and take care of people and love on people and get people saved and get people fed and, 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 and take care of their needs. You can't just go out and feed the hungry and feed the poor and think that you're being a good Christian because you can get so caught up in the doing that you forget the seeking. You can get so caught up in the being a Christian that you stop doing the word. You can get so caught up, listen, you can get so caught up in praise and worship. You can get so caught up in, in prayer. You can get so caught up in intercession. You can get so caught up in praying for people. You can get so caught up in evangelizing people. All of those things are good. All of those things are, are good things that are evidence of your, your Christianity, but the main and primary and first evidence of your Christianity is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. See, if you don't start there, then all the other things are just works that are trying to get yourself into heaven. And they stop relying on the blood of Jesus and start relying on your ability to do them. And, and when you fall into that place, then you stop building up your faith, which means that when you come to God in prayer, you stop believing whether he will do what you've asked. And, and it's not because you're not being a good Christian. You're, you're going to church. You're showing up to Bible study. You're, you're going out on, uh, on outreaches. And you're, you're doing things that people are, you know, hey, you know, I, I just ministered to somebody at the store. And I just ministered to somebody at the restaurant. You should. You should do that. But if you do that and you don't do this, you don't do the word. You don't get into his presence for you. You don't come to a place of, of seeking the kingdom and getting into his face and, and, and going into his presence and, and coming into the throne room for you. Then all of that stuff is just works. It, it has no eternal value. Wait, wait a second. I got somebody saved. Are you discipling them? Are they coming to church now? Have I, have I met them yet? Well, you got somebody saved at the restaurant. Where are they? What have you done to promote their salvation, to, to bring them into maturity in Christ? You ministered to somebody. 
That's good. But when you're seeking the kingdom, that ministry will change from just a work to something that produces fruit. See, when you produce fruit, then those things follow, this, the, the signs, the wonders, the miracles. And, and what? It's a, it is a sign and a wonder that not only did you pray for somebody and they cried and maybe they even said a prayer, but their life is completely altered and changed. They're hungry for more of the word. They're hungry for more of God. They want to show up to church, not because it's church, but because they can't wait to get more. Why? Because you didn't just give them a good work. You gave them good fruit. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want you to be very, very clear on this, that this does not say blessed are the poor. I don't know about you, but I haven't met a poor person who considers themselves blessed, like who's truly poor. Uh, there's plenty of people that, that uh, make do with little and, and have much because they're blessed in spirit, not, okay? I, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying that it is a very rare and unlikely thing for you to walk out on the street corner and find somebody who is poor and, and they feel blessed. I don't have a place to lay my head at night except on the street corner. I don't have food to put in my belly. I don't feel very blessed. Okay? So this does not say blessed are the poor. It doesn't say blessed are the people who don't have much finances. It doesn't say blessed are the people who remain humble and pious and don't have a lot of money because I don't need anything because God takes care of me. It doesn't say that. It says blessed are the poor in spirit. And what this means here, this word poor, it doesn't have anything to do with not having enough. This word poor here means needy and desperate for God. And when you are needy and desperate for God, you will pursue him beyond any, like nothing else matters. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs isn't the kingdom of heaven because they don't have much. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven because they are unwilling to not go after what is available. They're going to press in. They're going to get everything they can. They're going to dig deeper. They are seeking the kingdom first and his righteousness, knowing that all these things are going to be added to them. They are going after God. And, and, and they, there's no quit in them. L listen. Somebody who's truly desperate. Ha have, you, have you ever seen somebody who's truly hungry? Like, truly hungry. Like, there's a lot of people that live on the streets, but that they're not truly hungry because people feed them every day. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong. But if, if you've ever seen somebody, see, because I've seen people hand people out on those street corners food, and I've seen them turn around and throw it away because that wasn't the kind of food they wanted. They're not hungry. But I have seen what, one, time, one time we blessed um, a woman that was out on the street corner. And uh, as, it was in Ezra's heart. And we turned around and we brought her some food. I'm telling you, she sat, like, she grabbed it, said thank you, sat down, and she just, like, like she'd never eaten in her life. She was hungry. Uh, I saw one time when I was very young, uh, not very, very, I was a teenager, young teenager though, maybe 13, and um, my mother, temporarily, we, we had a, a little girl come stay with us. She didn't end up staying with us, she stayed with somebody else, but I remember when we put food in front of her, she ate like an animal. She just, like scarfed it into her mouth and she was scared that somebody was going to steal it from her she was hungry it, it there wasn't oh i could take it or leave it it didn't matter what it was there wasn't any pickiness oh i don't like that ew that's gross no it was food 
and she was hungry. And, and she had come out of a, a drug house. There was like 15 people living in the house and this little girl. She got food where she could get it, when she could get it, if she could get it. And so when you put food in her, it took, us, it took the family who took care of her a while to teach her to eat like a child instead of like an animal because she was so fearful that she wouldn't get another meal, that she was desperate for the food. When it's talking about poor in spirit, it's talking about us being hungry, truly hungry, where you are so desperate to get more of God that it doesn't matter, nothing else matters, you don't care about anything else except the need for what God has for you. That, that that's the only thing that will satisfy you. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. God says that my kingdom's gonna show up for those kind of people. My, my kingdom is gonna show up. That means that when I pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, when I have a desperation and a hunger for God, I, I have a guarantee that his kingdom's coming for me. And listen, this isn't his kingdom's coming for me someday. It's as theirs is the kingdom of God. And in other words, if we, put it, if we put it in more modern English, it would be the kingdom of God is theirs. The kingdom of God is theirs. That means it's present and evident right now in their life, visible because, because then the couple of verses down, it says, verse 6, it says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Because God says, those that will be hungry for me, those that will hunger for my righteousness, those that will be desperate for my presence, those that will be desperate for my kingdom, I'm going to fill them up. The kingdom is theirs. The kingdom is theirs. I'm not withholding anything from them. The kingdom is theirs. The kingdom belongs to them. This is where we can say the kingdom of God is in me. See, a lot of times we say, we say that here in this church, the kingdom of God is in me. But here's the thing, the kingdom of God is in you if the word is in you. See, you can be saved and not walk in the kingdom. You can be saved and not walk in the kingdom. Watch. Well, I don't know if that's true, Pastor Tara. Okay, let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Jesus is talking about the Pharisees, and he says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have to understand that when Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven, he's not talking about someday when you get to heaven. He's talking about, listen, he went about preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is now. The kingdom of heaven is in you. He went about preaching the kingdom, and everywhere he went about preaching the kingdom, the kingdom changed the curse. People got healed. People got delivered. People got set free from demons. People got changed every time he preached the kingdom. The kingdom is here. Is that, that's the good news of the gospel. The good news is that the kingdom is now. See, you have to understand, the good news isn't someday you get to go to heaven. That's not the, listen, you do get to go to heaven someday. But if I only tell you that the good news is, listen, if you get saved, someday you go to heaven. What good does that do you right now? If that's the case, maybe I just wait till I'm on my deathbed and say a prayer. Because if the kingdom of heaven isn't for right here, right now, for today, in my present circumstances, in my present life, where, where, where 
All hell is breaking loose against me if the kingdom of heaven isn't any good against that. Then what's the good news? What's the good news? What's the good news? Oh, well, you know, that's great. I don't know heaven someday, but I, what about right now? What about right now? What about what's going on in my life right now? What about what's going on in my kids or my grandkids or my my parents or my grandparents? What about what about the sickness or or the lack or the relationships breaking apart? What about what's happening today? The good news of the gospel of the kingdom is that it's for right now. And so what Jesus is saying here is, listen, if you will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. But if you don't, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to end up playing at righteousness. He's dealing with the Pharisees. The Pharisees think they're righteous, and they obey the law. But if, if you can't do and keep the law, then you're bound by the law, right? But he's saying when you're not under the law, you'll actually be more righteous, what what happens here then is this completely does away with this whole hyper grace thing that's going on in the world today because there is nothing in the word of god that gives us permission to sin well listen you do have permission to sin you can sin any way you want to but you will not walk in the kingdom of god the kingdom of heaven will not show up in your life thy kingdom come and thy will be done will not be present in you Okay, if, if you are not going to walk in this kingdom, if, if you're going to walk under the law, if you're going to perform your own righteousness, if you're going to do good works for people and just be a good Christian, or if you're going to, I'm going to just sin a little bit here and there because God loves me and he'll forgive me and it's okay. He still loves me anyways. He loves me in all my hangups. Okay, well, he does love you but he doesn't love your hangups. And he expects those hangups to change. He said that if you want the kingdom of heaven to enter, if you want to be walking, it says you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's not saying you don't get to go to heaven someday. He's not saying I'm revoking your ticket. He's saying heaven is available here, but if you're going to enter into heaven here, you're going to be more righteous than these Pharisees. And how are you going to be more righteous? Not because you're curbing your behavior, not because you're trying so hard to be a good person and do good works. You're going to be more righteous because you're seeking the kingdom. And you're seeking him first because you, you're poor in spirit, so you're desperately hungry for him. And since you're desperately hungry for him, you're not desperately hungry for sin. You can, you see, if, if you're hungry, truly hungry, but I put good food and bad food in front of you, listen, listen, you're hungry, you're starving, truly starvation. If I don't give you an option, you'll eat whatever's put there. But if I show you good food and gross food, if I put in front of you food that's rotten and moldy, but it's still food, and I, f I put in front of you food that's, that's good and well-prepared and it, and it smells amazing, you're not going to go eat the rotten and moldy food even if you're starving because you've now been given an option, right? If you're, it, you know... Uh, You've got people uh, throughout history that have been put into uh, prison, prisoners of war. They're going to eat whatever's put in front of them. But I tell you what, once they're out of there, they will never eat that again. Ever. Because they now know, they truly know the difference between what's good and what's evil. 
and they're never ever gonna pursue and go, oh, I'm just craving that moldy cheese and I'm just craving that bread that's so hard that I could barely chew it. And I, I'm craving the rice that was full of, of, of bugs and, and, and worms and I, I'm, cr no, absolutely not. They're not going to crave those things. They're going to be laying in that place dreaming about that steak dinner they had the, the week before they went off to war, and now they're stuck here. And I, 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 remember, I remember reading, what was that guy's name that, that we read about? The, uh, I remember reading Louis Zamperini's story, and I remember one of the things that kept them alive in the boat was they talked about food. Talked about, oh, my mama, she would cook this. And he would talk about the recipe. And they're starving in a boat in the middle of the ocean. And he's talking about the food that they're desperately hungry for. And it was almost as if the imagination of the food sustained them. I'm talking, that, that's what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about being so hungry for what is good. Amen? Your righteousness is going to exceed that of the Pharisees. So you, you're not going to walk around excusing your sin anymore because sin's going to become putrid and disgusting to you. Uh, it, it's going it, to... It, when, when you begin seeking God with all your heart, the things that used to draw on you and draw your attention, you're going to go, ooh. It's going to make you uncomfortable. Ooh. You, you don't even want to be around the people and the environments that you used to be drawn to because, ooh, that, ooh, that, that makes me uncomfortable. That grosses me out. Oh, the smell. Oh, I can't, I can't even think about the, the smell. Is it, it becomes a turnoff, the type of, you know, I, I remember... There, there's movies that we used to think, you know, we used to watch, and sometimes those things will come on, and I'm like, oh, that used to be my favorite movie, and then I'm sitting there like, ooh, ooh, what did I like about, what, ooh, why did I like that movie? There's nothing good about that movie. It makes me feel uncomfortable, and, and I, I feel like the Spirit of God is grieved, and I, man, I've told people that was a favorite movie of mine. It is not a favorite movie of mine. Oh, because... As you grow deeper in your walk and your relationship with God, as you dig deeper into his kingdom and seeking after his presence, the things that used to entice you no longer draw your attention. So you become more righteous than the Pharisees, not because you're such a good person, but because the things that used to entice you no longer have your attention. Now. Watch this. Then it's, he says here in uh, chapter 5, verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, nobody likes to be persecuted, right? I mean, who likes to be persecuted? Nobody likes to be persecuted. We're not going, oh, I desire persecution. This, uh, we're, we're not hungering after persecution. I just wish people would pick on me, and I wish people would hate. No, we're, we, we're not thinking that way. But it says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. See, as I'm seeking the kingdom, as I'm so hungry and desperate for the kingdom, what begins to happen is I'm no longer enticed by those things. So the people that used to spend time with me and hang out with me, what's wrong with you? You've changed. And, and some of them will be like, oh, what do you have? I want it. And others will be so completely turned off and disgusted by you and hate you and push you away and say horrible things about you and not want anything to do with you, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. It's okay that they don't want you. Watch, it looks like this. Turn with me to um, 2 Corinthians. This is what it looks like. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 
verse 14. It says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor. We're talking about savor here being uh, like an aroma. Like, you know, you're smelling a good food, right? For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. Next verse, please. To the one, we are a savor of death unto death and the other, the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? What, what it's talking about here is that when we get around people, the savor of Christ is supposed to be on our life. That means that people are supposed to see Christ in you. How do they see Christ in you? Oh, not just because you're such a good, holier, holier than thou person. What they're supposed to see is the kingdom. The kingdom's supposed to show up. You, you walked in the room, the kingdom's supposed to show up. When the kingdom shows up, things happen. The scripture says what... Uh, Let's, let's turn there, too. Uh, the scripture says in Matthew, I think it's 11 I want to go to. Matthew 11. To keep an eye on the time. I'm about to run out. Matthew. Yes. Matthew 11, verse 4. Uh, or verse 3. Uh John's disciples come to Jesus and they say, are you he that should come or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said to them, go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. So when you show up on the scene, the kingdom's supposed to show up. There should be something for them to both hear and see. Okay, he says, go and show John the things that you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. And the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. When you show up, the same things that we're seeing, because if I'm supposed to be showing Christ, right? I, I'm supposed to be a saver of Christ. I'm, that means that when I come in the room, there's the evidence of Christ in me. Not just because I'm a good person, there's a lot of good people out there. Okay, but so, so if it's just because I'm a good person, it's not enough. For them to see Christ, they have to see more than just a good person. They have to see the kingdom. There should be something for them to both hear and see. And what should they hear and see? They should hear and see the kingdom showing up because when the kingdom shows up, it alters the course of the curse. When the kingdom shows up, it alters the course of the curse. So whatever's a curse in their life, the kingdom shows up and you're supposed to alter the course of the curse. Now, when the kingdom shows up and the curse begins to alter course, they have the opportunity to respond. Either it will be a sweet savor to them and they will step over into the blessing of God and they will pursue along with you and become the savor of Christ just like you are. Or it will become a foul odor to them and, and they will shrink away from you and, and think that they, because what they see is death, not yours, theirs. Because they, they shrink back and, and as Jesus said, they loved darkness rather than light. And so they can't receive what you have to give to them, so therefore they persecute you. That's okay. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Now, we are to pray, thy kingdom come Thy will be done. I don't have any farther to go today. I'm going to jump back into this next week. I want you to think about that. I'm praying thy kingdom to come. What in your life or the lives of those around you needs to be altered? What, what course of the curse is operating in your life that needs to be changed? What do you need to see altered and changed course in your life? Because when you are praying Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Listen, how can anybody think that it's the will of God for cancer to teach you a lesson? Is there cancer in heaven? I am praying thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So for me to say that it's God's will for cancer to be in somebody's life to teach them a lesson, I'm implying that there's cancer in heaven. Because what I'm saying is his will to be done in the earth as it is in heaven. None of those curses are in heaven. So if I'm praying his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, the curse has to go. The course of that curse has to be reversed and change direction and go completely the opposite way because if the kingdom has come, then it's going to be on earth as it is in heaven. And there's no curse in heaven. Amen? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like to partner with us, please visit our website at lovewalkcc.org, or you can reach us by mail at 13319 Wallaceville Road, Houston, Texas, 77049. Remember, continue to walk in the extravagant love of Christ.